One professor told me that he believed in evolution, and I said, well, sir, do you believe your brain is nothing but three pounds of chemicals that got together by chance? By asking whether we are nothing but three pounds of chemicals, the preacher assumes that we are merely the sum of our parts. I don't think anyone believes that. And this preacher and many other preachers like him, like Frank Turek, for example, should admit that regardless whether we are more than that, we are certainly at least that. And the rest of this preacher's question of whether it got together by chance, again, forgets or rejects or refuses to acknowledge any of the many overlapping deterministic processes involved in the formation and subsequent evolution of life. As if to pretend instead, like someone shook up a bag of chemicals and poured out a man. This is not remotely like evolution at all. It's actually much more similar to the preacher's own religious belief in God creating Adam as a golem spell. The golem is an ancient Jewish tradition wherein you make a figurine out of the dust of the earth mixed with water and then breathe the breath of life into it. It's a magical enchantment, and that's how this preacher thinks we came about. He said, yeah. I said, then how can you trust your thoughts and the conclusions you come to? We can trust our thoughts and conclusions because, as David Hume himself explained, we have no choice but to make the same assumption as a child or a beast would, because we must, and because our perceptive and analytical faculties have been honed by innumerable generations of life and death situations. Remember that all our ancestors managed to survive at least long enough to have kids who were also survivors. But you shouldn't put too much faith in your own perception to trust your subjective impressions or interpretations completely either because illusions can fool us and biases can mislead us. Unlike computers, the human brain can corrupt information so that we both remember the same event differently if we both remember it at all, or we can even remember things that never happened, which is why it's good that we have others for objective verification or correction as necessary. But I have to wonder how believers think they can trust their thoughts and conclusions, because not only are you required to walk by faith instead of sight, so you can't even trust your own senses, but you also have to reject evident reality to make believe without reason and against all reason that you're just a magically animated mud golem. Maybe you got a chemical in there backwards. He did, by the way, several actually. But... That doesn't make any sense. What would it even mean to have a chemical in there backwards? The preacher doesn't know. As we've already seen, and we will continue to see, if it's real and true and relevant to this topic, then this preacher doesn't know anything about it. Then they tell the kids, well, DNA is pretty tiny, but that proves evolution. That's what this textbook says. We have evidence of evolution from molecular biology. Darwin speculated all forms of life are related. This speculation has been verified. They are lying to your kids. Nothing about DNA has helped with the evolution theory at all. DNA helped several things, the first of which was to provide a function for the mechanism Darwin had proposed. Natural selection needs variety to select from, and Darwin knew that every brood of baby animals inherited traits from both their parents, but he didn't know what these heritable units of information were or how they were blended together. An Augustinian monk named Gregor Mendel solved Darwin's dilemma with his discovery of genetics, which explained how these traits were combined. And then a Dutch botanist, Hugo de Vries, realized that mutations occur in these genes and that these were the source of variety for natural and sexual selection. The near continuous frequency of these mutations also illustrated a third mechanism, because when a population is divided into two or more smaller groups over many generations, unique mutations continually occur in each group that are not the same as those that appear in the other group. So each group effectively grows apart, becoming increasingly distinct. This is the mechanism of genetic drift, when the type of diversity has no significant impact on survival or reproduction, and thus Darwinian selection doesn't really apply to those diverging variations. DNA, which stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, is the most complex molecule in the universe. Unbelievably complicated molecule. That little DNA molecule, average person has 50 trillion cells in their body with 46 of those little molecules in each cell. 46 chromosome strands in each cell of your body. If you extracted all of it, it would only fill about two tablespoons. But if you took those DNA strands and unwound them, <coughs> stretched them out, tied them together, one person's DNA would reach from Earth to the moon and back over half a million times. Round trips to the moon. 
I can't find any sources that match the preacher's numbers, but it doesn't really matter what the numbers are. As impressive as whatever large numbers may sound, none of that implies a god or challenges evolution. They say the DNA holds more, compute, more information than all computer programs ever written by man combined. IBM models the newest computers after DNA. The quantity of information is so vast, we have to invent new numbers to measure it. Not terabytes, petabytes, or exabytes, yottabytes, and zettabytes. All the words uttered by everyone who ever lived would amount to five exabytes. And your DNA and your chromosome holds more information than that. It is so unbelievably complex. If you typed out the code found in your DNA, when you got done typing, you'd have enough books to fill Grand Canyon 78 times. According to this article, DNA could hold a lot more information than it does if it's converted in a particular way that would also make the data much harder to extract. But as it is, our DNA doesn't really hold that much information, really. We'll talk about how much it really does have in the next episode, but according to this article and a few others like it, if we convert DNA into binary computer language, then we could fit three different genomes onto a single DVD. That's the instructions to make you. I'd say you're pretty special. Quite a list of instructions to make you. David said, I will praise thee for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And he didn't have a, he didn't have a microscope and he could figure that out. Mm -hmm. yeah. If he had a microscope and a modern education, then he would probably regard our biology as even more wondrous than creationists do. We also understand that there were natural processes involved. We don't just pretend that it all happened by magic and then make up an imaginary wizard or genie to praise for it. You know, from conception to birth, the baby adds 15,000 cells per minute to its body. Each one is more complicated than a space shuttle. This preacher's estimate is three times too high. It's only about 5,000 cells per minute if you average it out over that whole time. It would probably only be one minute or so when it really was like that because cell growth accelerates exponentially. How would you like to, like to be in charge of the supply end of supplying a factory that is producing 15,000 space shuttles a minute? And it's your job to make sure they have all the nuts and bolts and screws and everything they need to put that thing together. Some of you women are saying, boy, I did it. And that's hard, too. Sometimes they want pickles in the middle of the night, you know. <laughs> what are you building down there anyway, you know? Uh, <clears throat> the probability of one DNA happening by chance has been calculated to be one in 10 to the 119,000th power. That's a big number when you figure the entire visible universe is about 10 to the 28th inches in diameter. Ah, the argument from improbability fallacy. Look at everything you did or experienced yesterday. What are the odds against all of those things happening exactly the way they did? Not just in that particular order, but at that exact time, each time. If you account for enough of the variables, you can make yesterday seem mathematically impossible. But it happened, didn't it? So that's a probability of one. And what is the probability of one DNA happening? What does one DNA even mean? Are we talking about a codon, a nucleotide? The preacher doesn't know. But science has models showing a definite possibility of DNA forming from an RNA-first catalyst, such that it turns out that the probability is likely. DNA has not proven anything that would help the evolution theory. DNA has illustrated and demonstrated everything necessary for evolution. And remember that evolution is a change in allele frequencies of reproductive populations over many generations. So DNA is how we measure evolution to prove that it's happening and to show exactly how it is happening. It's been made the problem much, much, much worse. Worse for creationists because modern genomic research has allowed us to trace all of human migration, not to Mount Ararat or the Garden of Eden, but to Central Africa, where we find a series of mitochondrial eaves, none of whom lived with or knew Y-chromosome Adam. We can go even further by including the genes of other human species, Neanderthals, Denisovans, and others, with overlapping genomes and matching fossils, both dating and correlating to hundreds of thousands of years old. 
And it gets even worse for creationists because the wealth of genetic studies reveals a molecular phylogeny of living primates, showing how humanity is indeed genetically nested amongst all the other apes, and that we share the same endogenous retroviruses with them and with earlier monkeys too, effectively proving our common ancestry with them, a series of common ancestors with them. And the evidence of evolution that genes have provided still gets even worse for creationists because it allows us to chart our divergence, not just from other people, not just from other human species, not just from other primate families. It allows us to show our evolutionary divergence from and genetic connection with all other mammals, all the way back to the end of the dinosaurs and before then. DNA has proven evolution as well as evidence could ever prove anything. Just like getting a paternity test and finding out that your father was an ape and that you're a monkey's uncle. But let's just assume that the chromosome number means something. And that, you know, it, it could evolve. Okay, well then I did some research on this. I discovered penicillin has two chromosomes. That one had to evolve first. And then slowly over millions of years, they got some more chromosomes, because they're complicated, you know, and turned into a fruit fly. You can see the similarity there, it's only got eight chromosomes. And then very slowly it evolved some more chromosomes and became either a tomato or a house fly. Very tough to tell the difference. They're identical twins, you know. And then very slowly over millions of years, it evolved into either a pea, or a bee, you can see the similarity there, you know, P, B, very similar, and slowly became lettuce and then a carrot, and finally when we got to 22 chromosomes, triplets. The possum, the redwood tree, and the kidney bean all have 22 chromosomes. Average scientists cannot tell them apart. <laughs> let's see, which one is which here? Okay, let's see, tree, possum, bean, huh. Uh, and we have 46, folks, and if we can just get two more, the next step of human evolution we're going to become a tobacco plant. I know some already smell like it. Sometimes I'll get on the elevator and I'll say, man, you're evolving, you're way ahead of me. And it probably won't happen in my lifetime, but we might get enough chromosomes someday to be either a dog or a chicken. They're twins too, you know. And then way down the road, you know, we're going to become a carp. They got double the chromosomes we do. And someday, star date 34, 95, 72, we're going to become a fern. I was at a church one time and this lady walked up to me afterwards and she said, Mr. Hoven, I'm Fern. <laughs> I shook hands with that hand right there. I'll never wash it again. There comes a point where mere stupidity alone cannot account for all of this ineptitude. It's not just that the preacher is ignorant and incurious. He can admit that natural selection works as long as he refuses to admit that mutations provide the variety. And he can admit that speciation happens, as long as he doesn't admit that that means macroevolution, because he cannot honestly admit that, and that's the real problem here. It's not that the preacher is mentally incapable of comprehension. He has to ridicule a theory he clearly doesn't understand because he doesn't want to understand it, and he is actively trying not to, with distortions sufficient to keep him and his audience both confused. He certainly doesn't want his listeners to know what the theory really is, because then they might consider it, and if they do that, they might get it. If they learn what evolution really is, they'd believe it, because it makes sense. The preacher knows that. And the audience doesn't want to learn the truth either. They, they want to make believe something else. That's why they pay the preacher to make up these ridiculous parodies in defense of their favorite fantasy. Hey, <laughs> how come the evolutionists are always comparing things that fit their theory why don't they show us the things that don't fit their theory? Because there isn't any actual fact that contradicts evolution the way so much of so many different fields of science all contradict, refute, and disprove biblical creationism. Like, let's just say we're going to examine how things evolved based upon how long they lived. Well, we could arrange animals by how long they live, and we'll find out the hamster evolved first, slowly turned into a cat, and then a canary, and then a dog, and then a chimpanzee, and an alligator, elephant, horse, turtle, and human. We made it, folks. We made it. Instead of basing it on how long they live, which wouldn't make any sense anyway, and that's why this preacher uses this when he needs a nonsense obfuscation, let's base it on how long ago they lived. Now, most of the animals he just listed are very recent, from the last 10 million years or so ago, except for the cat, which is older than most of his other examples, and the alligator, which is older than the cat, and the turtle, which is a lot older than everything else on his list. Let's, uh, let's ex arrange the animals based on how long they're pregnant, their gestation period. Well, in that case, the possum, only 13 days. How'd you like that, ladies? Only be pregnant for 13 days, not bad, huh? Yeah, I'd have a bunch of kids in. 
Uh, slowly evolved into a hamster, then a rat, then a rabbit, kangaroo, on down the list, and the elephant. 640 days. They are the winner. The most evolved creature on earth. Or maybe you can see here the cat and the dog are identical twins, you know. Again, the preacher's ridiculous assertions are a deliberate distortion into parody. His listeners should know the fact that there is one and only one taxonomic construct that makes any sense or that any intelligent person would consider and that every honest thinker will consider. That there were reptiles before there were mammals and there were amphibious forms before the first reptiles, including fish with feet. Those are the facts to account for. But the preacher is not accountable. He doesn't want to understand reality. His job is to make believe and make you believe in his favorite fable. Maybe we should uh, arrange them based on how much they weigh in their adult form. Well, the shrew only weighs four grams. Slowly it became a mouse. And very slowly, slowly, over billions of years, became a whale. But the whale's the most evolved now. Why don't they show us these charts, huh? I'm not sure how anyone could pretend that this could be an alternate theory of how things really happened. Because classifying organisms by their weight makes no more sense than classifying them by their astrological sign. And why is it that amphibians have five times more DNA than mammals and some amoeba have a thousand times more DNA? They don't tell us these things because it doesn't fit their theory. We do show these things because it does fit the theory. And if there was anything that didn't fit the theory, we would show that too. But the number of chromosomes and the size of the genome and the amount of junk DNA is variable. We know how and why that is. So while there are some hypotheses that the oldest living animal forms have the largest and most convoluted DNA, we know that isn't always going to be the case. Because not all mutations are merely point mutations. Some can delete large amounts of genetic data all at once. And we should keep that in mind and not make the sort of simplistically silly, stupid assumptions that this preacher does. Shut up! Shut! Shut up! Shut!